And then they could take those insights and apply them to their real world situation. And we discovered that it only took three days, I'm not exaggerating here, three days to break down the stereotypes and the polarization. When, to give you a sense of when we began this work was in March of um, 03, 2003. And um, we were up in Ngozi, a little town in northern Burundi. And we were using the Search for Common Ground facility. And I remember walking into this room and there were our 35 participants sitting around the table, catatonic, not, because they suddenly realized that all their worst enemies were sitting with them at this table. And, and then I looked around the corners of the room and there were these four South African soldiers who were guarding the rebels who had come out of the country into Burundi to experience this process. And they were standing in those four corners of the room with guns. And, I, and my first task was to go up to these soldiers and say, would you mind standing outside of this room just to improve the ambiance a little bit? <laughs> um, but just to give you a sense of, of, of the tension and of what was going on. Um, well, what happened in this process was so remarkable that within about 60 days, by then we were working with about 65 leaders. We had joined the first two groups together. That the military leadership, the Tutsi general and the chief of staff and the Hutu rebel leaders, there were six of them, asked if we would quickly organize training for their commanders jointly to prepare for the ceasefire that had not yet been signed, but was about to be signed. And so we brought 37 military commanders directly from the battlefield and do a six day workshop in Nairobi, the only time we worked outside of the country. Um, and it was stunning. I'm not too sure it was more frightened the first couple of days, they or we. But when they, by the end of those six days, they had built so much cohesion and camaraderie that they came to us and said, look, will you please expand this program as widely and quickly as you can? The United Nations then asked us to train 84 ex-combatants, mixed groups, rebels and army, to serve as observers of the whole demobilization process and reintegration process. And then we were asked by the chief of staff of the army to train 100 members of his high command. And then the head of the new national police force requested the same training. Uh, and then the president uh, subsequently asked us to, well, the chief of staff, to do training of trainers so they could incorporate this methodology in the National Military Academy and make it sustainable over time. Um, and then after the and then when the elections were approaching, the uh, Burundians were very anxious there was going to be more violence. It was the first democratic election in many, many years. And so we brought together all the political leaders, the top leaders of all the parties. And we had the same experience. We did the regular training the first three days. The last three days, we turned it over to the participants to find what they wanted to do and how they wanted to see. And in that instance, they decided that they wanted to write their own election code of conduct, which became the official code. So they owned it. It wasn't imposed on them. Then they decided they wanted to issue a joint communique to the public to reassure everyone of their joint commitment to work for an election without violence or intimidation. Then they said, thirdly, that they wanted more training. So a month later, we brought them back together in Bujumbura for two days. And then they said they wanted the media to be present at the training so the media could see them collaborating instead of fighting as they had always experienced them. And we ended up with a very successful election in Burundi uh, five years ago. Um, and then after the election, the president approached me and asked if we could provide training for his new council of ministers and then for the parliamentary leadership. And all of that work continues to this day in one form or another. 
Um, now, I've already, you know, you know the situation in Burundi. I'm not going to repeat that. The key characteristics that we were confronting with them that led to all this mistrust are listed right here. Um, and then, as I said, we had several, we ended up with spinning off without, a, initially we had only our plan was to do just the first unit, BLTP 95, the 95 mixed group of leaders. But then, but then the Bruneians took ownership of the program and started making requests for all this other work. And so we did all this work with the security sector, political party leaders, the government, and we even developed a community-based program at the grassroots in two provinces where our trainer developed a curriculum in Kurundi, the indigenous language, and that could be accessible to illiterate population. And we trained 20 Burundian trainers to do this training in their indigenous language rather than in French. And these 20 trainers moved into grassroots communities in these very volatile, contested provinces and, I, and, and identified, and we, we were told it would never work, the Burundians would exclude anyone who was not from their community. But they all moved into communities not of their origin. And they then basically took root in the community, identified both the formal and the informal leaders, invited them into this kind of training process to build cohesion within the community. And then uh, USAID provided grants for community development, which was the end product of the work they began to do together. It was a very successful initiative. Um, and this trainer who did this work is extraordinarily creative. Um, Okay, let me just say a word now about, th there are two keys to this kind of work being successful. The first key is getting the trainers that are good and the training methodology right. And, I, and I've here characterized some of the key aspects of the training. It's very process-centric, experience-based, that is, they use their experiences in the workshop and draw their lessons from that experience. Very interactive, of tremendous emphasis upon communication skills and techniques. A lot of it involves the work of this very famous guy at Harvard, whose name escapes me, um, on interest-based negotiations. He wrote the book, Getting to Yes and Getting Past No. Some of you will know it. Fisher. Fisher. Um, and both of my key trainers were trained by Fisher. So a lot of it involved this interest-based negotiation effort. Um, and then we did the SIMSOC, which uh, Jean uh, Barak and I had worked with, uh, and my mother and Chet Rogers at the university, where we did SIMSOCs in Kalamazoo. It's an all-day simulation with racially divided communities all across Michigan and many other states as well. And I got permission from the author to use this translate that into French, use it in Africa, and that became one of the real linchpins of, of everything we were doing because it had such powerful impact on those who became involved in the simulation. And if time permits, I can give you some examples of some of the specific techniques and why they work so powerfully. Um, the building a climate of mutual trust, building relationships, all of that is essential. And a reminder that there is no quick fix. This kind of work must be done repetitively over the long term. The second key to making this kind of training succeed is getting the right people into the room. I mean, obviously, you drag 35 people off the street, and anyone who participated would, would personally gain from it. But unless they were strategically located, within their institutions, within their constituencies, it wouldn't have much strategic impact, which is why we spent so much time being careful about the selection of who we brought into the process. Um, the way you approach this work will vary from country to country. In the case of Burundi and in the case of the Congo, I had the advantage of having served as special envoy for five years. Uh, I built relationships with all the key players. 
Um, and then we had World Bank support in the first case in Burundi, which led to a certain level of gravitas for the effort. And then we had a couple of key Burundians, one Tutsi, one Hutu, who had somehow transcended their conflict and were so respected by everyone that their identification with our work gave it even additional credibility. But in other cases, you may not have all that going for you. In the case of the Congo, we didn't. I mean, I had my contacts. Um, we couldn't go with any Congolese leaders or figures um, as the face on the ground because no one trusted anyone there. It was just amazing. And so, but everyone knew one guy they wanted. He was a Frenchman who for eight and a half years had led the United Nations humanitarian mission in the Congo and was beloved by everyone. And I flew up to Geneva and I recruited him away from the United Nations and he's still running the program on the ground in, in the Congo. In Liberia, where the United States has unique leverage and capacity, it was actually the U.S. Embassy that extended invitations to all the people we needed to talk to. And everyone turned up, not even knowing what they were coming for. Um, so everywhere it's a different you know, process. Um, but one thing that doesn't vary is the importance of the national ownership of the process. I think we've been so successful because neither the Congolese, nor Liberians, nor Burundians ever felt we were trying to impose our particular notions about what they ought to be doing. And they owned the process, they really did. Um, um, come on. It does not seem to be moving. Let me just go through it verbally. Um, oh, good. Third point, advantages of, well, I, I already mentioned earlier. Well, I didn't, I did not. We always were very clear that we were not offering a negotiating forum. That this was not a political forum. It was a place to strengthen individual skills. That way we depoliticized it. And people would come into a process that they would not enter if they thought there was a negotiation about to take place. They wouldn't talk to the other guys at that point. And that helped enormously in getting people to, to join the work. We also did a lot of appeals to their ego. I remember we sent out a letter once we identified who we wanted. We sent this letter out that began you have been selected as your fellow by your fellow Burundians as a key to your country's future. And, you know, and then we invited them into the process. Everyone wanted to participate. We had no trouble recruiting people. Um, and then we always emphasized the importance of inclusivity. Many times the late largest rebel group didn't want the other rebel groups present. And we refused to work with them unless they accepted that. And they eventually did. We insist upon inclusivity and in getting all the key players at the table. <clears throat>